Hello, hello. Hey. While we're waiting pe for people to come, um, that that bug, um, the the one where there's that assert, Alyssa, um, on the on the message begin headers, I, I think it's a bug actually in HTTP parser. Um, yeah, do you do you know off the top of your head whether um, before the beginning of a um, before the beginning of a response, so like before it says like HTTP one one. Are you allowed to have CRLF in there? Because, because the code in HTTP parser in certain paths um, makes it seem like you can. But basically what's happening is that if there's a carriage return or line feed before the beginning of the response, it'll fire the on message begin callback multiple times. So there's a, so, so it's, it's definitely a bug in the parser. Um, I'm just not sure if, if like it should be, allowed or or not um silo with them and see what they think um, yeah I, I mean i i i i think i'm just going to add a test and like because there's three different cases where this happens and in two of the other cases it just ignores carriage return line feed um in this one case because of the bug every time you get a carriage return or line feed instead of just skipping it it'll fire the on message begin callback um so that's that's why it's all going haywire, uh, but but like based on the spec, it, it was unclear to me if that's even legal. But I, I guess I'll, I'll just I'll make a test and file an issue. I have never seen that. Oh, but there's all sorts of things that shouldn't happen that are technically right. allowed. I I actually don't think this one is. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's allowed either, which is surprising because they have strict mode and and not strict mode. So. It's, I'm not. I'm not sure what's going on there. But it's only message to begin. It's not treating it as like, hey, you sent an invalid message, and then just mm -hmm. like, no, no, yeah, it's it's definitely a bug. So uh, yeah, we can work around it and then just have them fix upstream. Well, and yeah, I mean, it's a it's a pretty simple fix. So I'll, I'll just do the fix. But yeah, we can we can see how that goes. This is the one where we get the health check response before we actually sent the request. Well. Yeah, I mean, so there's the there's the fuzz test failure that Harvey found. So I, I debugged that. I'm not sure if that's the same issue as as the WebSocket one that was reported. I think it probably is, but I have to test it. Um, but like, because I'm guessing that the WebSocket thing for some reason is like sending either a, a carriage return or line feed before the actual response. Uh, that's my guess. But like, I will I will go and debug it. All right. Um, let's see. So uh, we have a couple of things on the agenda. I guess is is Greg on the call? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. So I don't know. I was thinking we could do the like just the the quick items first, and then we could talk about the WebSocket stuff. Okay. Um, I see the first quick one is it is it uh, came up during code review that uh, historically in release notes we have not put bug fixes. Uh, I, I don't really have a strong opinion. Uh, I, like I, I think some projects they'll break out um, they'll they'll break out you know things into features and bug fixes and then with the bug fixes they'll link to like the original issue. Um, it would be a little more overhead for dealing with fixes. Do, do people, do people have a preference on that? I, I don't. I don't really care. I think I'd be okay with kind of taking it on a case by case basis on the severity of the bug. Like if it's unlikely anyone has ever seen the the bug, yeah. not yeah. bother. If it's a big thing, then definitely. Okay. If All right. In between, then just kind sure. of. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it, yeah, it, it kind of, it seems like unnecessary overhead to like list every individual bug fix. So that's fine. I mean, why don't, um, I will do a, a, a PR to the PR template that basically says roughly that, that like we can use our judgment as to if it's a pretty severe bug fix that we can, we can add it. Any, anyone have any objections to that? All right. I'll, I'll do that. Um, I guess, 
uh, Dave, do you, do you want to give a quick network service extension update before we get into WebSockets? Sure. So, um, so I, I, I've continued to uh, grind through the file descriptor, you know, socket call replacement. I've just about got the PR ready to uh, do an initial push. Uh, the place where I'm going to need some input and some help is, um, you know, how do we, how do you want us to, to take the, um, you know, network service factory and hook that into the config stuff. That was kind of a little confusing to me about where to put that. And so um, I think we had just discussed that. Um, yeah, I would, I would probably not worry about that right now. Like yep. I would, I would get rid of the FD first, like yep. in, in all the different places. Uh, yep. And, and like, you don't even have to do that in one PR. Like if it makes you feel more comfortable, like you can keep, the file descriptor like password is today and then just start passing this abstraction object that also has the FD and then right. like we can do incremental PRs where we like get rid of all the FD calls. Um, and, okay. that, and that might be the better way to do it than one, one giant PR. All right. Well, I, I pretty much have the giant PR done, which I think is, is, is certainly worth uh, having as a roadmap. And then we can look at, so I'll, I'll push that the next day or so. Yep. And then we can, you know, we can roll out an implementation uh, thing. So, I mean, some of the other minor questions are, you know, there are some socket calls in the OS syscalls uh, class, singleton class. And, you know, does it have value to, to leave those around? I initially ripped them out, but then today I was thinking, well, maybe for testing purposes, that's still a value, but, you know, for the most part. Uh, we had put them in mainly for testing just so that we could override those calls. And right. I think essentially once we have a registerable object, we could just as easily swap out an object that does a fake syscall. Yes. Right? All right. So I yep. think that would fulfill the need in a, in a more clean way, but it may take a couple steps before you get to that point again, because you have to be able to configure it and then have that test mocked out one. Yeah. And, and there's also, if you need to be able to test the actual uh, object that does the sock, you know, the, the actual syscalls, you may still want this. It right. Well, that was right. So that was, so that was really, that was around. really the thought I had last night when I was, when it's wending through, uh, some of my cleanup was what, when, when we start to test this stuff, whether that still has value, it probably does. Um, and so, and I'm, and I'm still, I mean, there, there are still a bunch of places and, um, well, I'll push something sooner rather than later at this point because I think I've got enough volume to to generate a good discussion. But um, there's still a lot of places, even with that, where they're just native, you know, socket calls that uh, exist around the code base that ideally we want to get rid of those, but we want to do that in a structured fashion. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a, a big project. It it has a tremendous amount of value even outside of VPP just because we're oh, gonna, absolutely I mean, yep. we're going to end up eventually porting the code to Windows and I mean it's like there's just there's a whole bunch of different reasons why this yep. ends up being super useful so uh, I, I mean I, I think all of the work that you're doing is, is going to be great it just it doesn't have to be I guess what we're saying is it doesn't have to be done in like one giant drop like if it makes sense to do it incrementally that, that's probably right well I I, I just kind of ran into the you know pulling the thread un unraveling the sweater trick. <laughs> and so uh, I just kept going because I, it just, it, it made sense to me to, to keep um, exploring that. Um, yeah. I mean, let's just, let's just look at so. the giant PR. Like I, I actually think for the most part, it's going to be fairly mechanical or it, or it should be. So right. let's just see it. And, and then if it looks like there are some obvious places where we could split it up, you know, we can do yep. that. Sounds like a plan. Great. Okay, WebSocket. Um, maybe either Alyssa or, or Greg, could you catch everyone up on, on the conversation because it's, it's kind of complicated. Sure. Um, so essentially right now, to, for those of you not terribly familiar with WebSockets, essentially you send an HTTP header saying, I'd like to upgrade to WebSockets. And then everything following that upgrade, the, and they, there was a response header saying, yes, your upgrade succeeded or no. And then from then on, kind of what normally would have been HTTP payload is WebSocket data. 
So right now, the way it's implemented in Envoy for HTTP 1.1 is uh, Envoy intercepts those, those headers, says, great, this is WebSocket, um, and then basically detaches the rest of the, the request processing to the TCP proxy session, saying, look, this is no longer HTTP. We're just going to proxy the WebSocket payload uh, upstream and be done with. So there was a request saying, okay, that's all well and good, but we'd like it if, if the WebSocket request headers went through the normal HTTP filter chain because the, the upgrade headers are headers. So that would be nice. Uh, meanwhile, there's a second uh, issue that uh, about how to handle WebSocket for H2. And there's a spec in progress theoretically should be ratified in the next week or so if it hasn't already, saying basically for HTTP2, where you can't take over the entire upstream connection, you would use connect to effectively tunnel this WebSocket data on one H2 stream, um, which makes a lot of sense. But the problem is at that point, the H2 WebSocket, the headers and all the data would go through your headers and, and normal HTTP data calls. Meanwhile, the HTTP path, we're doing it with this weird kind of hybrid of handling the HTTP headers eventually and then, and then TCP proxy handoff for the data. Um, doing it differently seems like it's going to cause a lot of confusion in the long run, especially because if your upstream is auto, is doing HTTP or HTTP2, you know, like halfway through, you're deciding what, what weird thing you're doing. So we're just trying to resolve what we want to do and ideally unify these cases if we can find a way that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, my my idea, which would be a bunch of work, is to actually make, make new filters um, and then basically have parallel filter stack. Uh, so like, and I, I think a lot of the filters that you have could implement both interfaces but that would basically allow you to specify um, even like on a per route basis, potentially um, that, that you could fork off or maybe even not per route, but like on a, on a HTTP connection manager level, you could have like a, like a WebSocket filter stack and then like a non WebSocket filter stack. And that would, uh, that would require <clears throat> filters to opt in to basically being WebSocket aware instead of suddenly getting into a situation in which, you know, you have filters that might now be getting WebSocket data and then like some of the calls might be different. <coughs> so for example, like you don't need a hundred continue or like those, those types of things. So um, that was one idea that came to mind that seems like the most extreme solution, but it might lead to the least amount of confusion. Yeah, the thing I don't love about that is, is again, I, I'm concerned that the API would be similar enough that you couldn't yeah. reuse the code. Like, essentially, you need the, the, the same headers and the same data functions. Um, we just might mean them slightly differently. Well, it doesn't, I, I mean, I, I guess, again, like, this is mostly brainstorming. It doesn't even necessarily mean that we have to define, like, new interfaces in code. It would more just mean that you would have to, as a user, effectively opt in to say that like these are the filters that run if it's a if it's a web socket connection okay, so more right from a config perspective because right exactly that. like right so right so like it would be more of a config thing where then what the so right now if you look at the connection manager code we end up instantiating the filter stack like right when the stream is created but there's no technical reason that we have to do that like we could actually wait until we get headers complete so we would know if it's a WebSocket upgrade request. And then at that point, we could basically say like not WebSocket instantiate the not WebSocket filter stack. Uh, WebSocket instantiate the WebSocket filter stack. And like you could imagine that in, um, in the WebSocket case, you actually have like a WebSocket router or like something like that, that, that like knows how to do uh, like all of this HTTP2 versus like TCP proxy stuff. So like instead of the TCP proxy being bolted into the HTTP connection manager, you would allow it to flow through. And then at the end of the WebSocket chain is like a WebSocket router. And again, like maybe that's mostly the same code as the current router. Like maybe it's the same code. I, I don't, I don't really know. Um, but, but that could take care of the, is it HTTP 1.1? Like maybe do the TCP proxy thing. Like if not do, do, do something else. Um, that, that's kind of what comes to mind. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure how else you would do it without it being 
potentially super confusing if people are trying to support both non-WebSocket and WebSocket routes? Yeah, I think having the, the config filters different is totally reasonable. I don't understand what value the TCP proxy session would have in that case, the, 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 the current handoff we have. Because I no, thought no, no, right. So, so to bypass. No, right. So I'm actually suggesting to, to, to get rid of okay. the, like the, the way that we do it today, which is to bolt it directly into the connection manager. I'm suggesting that we basically kill that. Okay. And then, but, but we still need something at the end of the line, right. That basically knows what to do with that data. Um, so, right. Because like, you're not, you're not proxying like a full connection at that point, you might need to make like a, like a dedicated upstream connection um, and then kind of switch into TCP mode. So, so like, I don't, I, I mean, again, I haven't thought about this enough, but it doesn't seem like you could just rip the code out of HTTP connection manager and like use the existing router. Like it just, it, it, it wouldn't work. So that's kind of why I'm saying is that you could have the existing filters, like an alternate WebSocket filter stack where you could do header manipulation and maybe even data manipulation or something like that. Um, and yes. then I'm still actually a little bit confused why, why you think we need something different at the end. So just internally, we treat WebSockets as HTTP 1.1 data. It's just by die. That's the only difference. So we literally use, I mean, our, when you do the upstream connection, you have to pass the headers on and then we just pass the headers on and then say, great, you're streaming data back and forth from then on. Yeah, maybe, maybe it would work. I'm just thinking through the cases where like, if you went to a connection pool that was like trying to reuse a connection and like you had like previously sent like a non WebSocket connection there and then you like reuse it on the pool. I, I just like, I feel like there's going to be corner cases there. Like it's not, it's not clear to me that in the current code, it will work with all edge cases out of the box. Like I feel like you could get into a situation where let's say that I have an upstream that supports both WebSocket and not WebSocket and I'm doing connection pooling. Maybe I've pipelined or sorry, I've like, you know, I've sent some requests. I've gotten some responses with keep alive. Can I then switch that connection over to WebSocket? Like, is that okay? Maybe, I, I don't know. Works for us. I don't know if it's legal. No, 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 right. So, so it's like it, it's. I mean, it might, it might totally work. Uh, uh, I, 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 I just don't know. So, I think those are things that might need to kind of get get sorted out. Greg, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, I think I don't really have strong feelings either way. Uh, I agree that what we have now is is a bit of a kludge. Uh, does anyone actually have the time to? do the work to sort this out? Well, if it's, I mean, large, it depends. Um, if, it's, if it's just allow a separate filter config for, you know, for WebSocket versus not and delay the filter creation, I could probably, I could probably tackle that. I have WebSocket, sorting out WebSockets as one of my goals at this quarter. Okay. Um, okay. So that sounds like it's pretty straightforward if we, if we, and, but this is where I was trying to understand, like, do we need to move the TC proxying code or do we just mix it or kind of what's the plan? Well, so I think if we've already established the upstream connection through some means, then the value we're getting from the TCP proxy is getting to be pretty minimal. I mean, you know, just send proxying back and forth between two connections isn't, isn't that much code. No, right. So the, the existing router code should work fine for that. It, it's more, and again, this is just because I'm not super familiar with WebSocket. I feel like inevitably the, at least the router filter is going to have to, if we use the router in both cases, the router filter will have to become WebSocket aware to, to some degree. Like I'm guessing it, it might have to do the connect or like it might, it might have to know various things and, and like, and again, I'm also not sure, this is just being not familiar with the WebSocket kind of spec, is is it okay that like you, we might be using a generic HTTP 1.1 connection pool? Like could we have used those connections for non-WebSocket traffic and then can we upgrade it to a, to a WebSocket connection? Like, is that okay? I don't know. Yeah, so I, I mean, it's like if it's, 
if it's okay, uh, then I think it's easy. If it's not okay, I, I still don't think it's super hard, but it's just like there might be some other cases yeah. here where like we might just have to deal with it basically. Okay, so I think, I think I'm willing to take on having a separate configurable filter chain reusing the HTTP filters because we think they're API compatible and you know, buyer beware, I'll comment that you shouldn't configure non WebSocket compatible filters on the WebSocket. I mean, I, I, that should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, I, right. And, and, then, and, I, and then as people run into issues of like, hey, my upstream server doesn't support pipeline WebSocket, can you all have an option to not do that? You know, we can add it as needed. Right. And, and like, it might, it, it might be good just to kind of list out like, what are the, like, what are the gotchas of the current situation? And like that, that would be one that comes to mind where like, I could just see that not, not working. Like yeah, if so we, I'll, yeah. I'll comment that one, I'll comment the fact that we have to do the upgrades and downgrades somewhere. Oh, the other thing I'm actually really uncomfortable with, this is, this is the other one I wanted to bring up. Um, and again, this, this may come under like, Hey, you shouldn't use this filter for a WebSocket is if we, we have to do the upgrade and the downgrade at the last possible point because we don't know if we're speaking HP 1.1 or H2 uh, until we hit the router filter. But the thing is that you're actually literally changing the method. So if you have something like the course filter, which is blocking via method, like what should the method be? Pretty much everywhere else in Envoy, we say everything that Envoy does is HTTP 2, and then we downgrade to HTTP 1.1 style headers on the way out. I feel like for WebSocket, it's it almost should be the other way where we should treat everything as like a WebSocket upgrade all the way through. Like even on the H2 path, when we get it, say, hey, this is, this is logically a guess with an upgrade to WebSocket, treat it as WebSocket all the way through. And then at the last moment, it downgraded to connect. And I wanted to get people's thoughts on that because it's doing twice the work for one of the paths, but it ensures kind of consistency when you're going to the filter chain. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion as to whether you like, kind of make it one, one or like make it two. But I, I definitely agree that um, what, what, what has made that code in Envoy so much simpler is that we kind of normalize all of that logic. Yeah, so I, I, I think, normalize it. yeah. And like everywhere else in Envoy we're normalized on each two, but normalizing on each two WebSockets is weird because they're like an afterthought. So I can go either way. I don't know if anyone else, Greg, if you have thoughts or opinions on that one. I don't feel strongly about it. Uh, okay. The other thing I wanted to bring up is what are we going to do with the changes to the configuration that will be needed? This will probably end up being not backwards compatible configuration wise. Yep. So I'll have to do the deprecation dance where we say the old style of doing things is deprecated and wait a cycle and then get rid of it. Okay, uh, so are we going to leave the old implementation there essentially until the deprecation is finished? I think, I think we'd have to. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you'd make the configuration compatible without no. that. The configuration yeah. is based pretty heavily on the implementation. No, I think I think we'll add the new WebSocket path and then deprecate. The, the only thing that I could think of, which might be possible, but I'm not sure, is if someone had set the WebSocket true thing on any route, you could maybe make, that you could implicitly make a, a WebSocket filter stack with only the router filter in it. Um, mm -hmm. And that might work, uh, but, that, but that requires more thinking. Yeah. I think I think I'm just going to say the old way is deprecated once the new one's implemented, and mm -hmm. then we'll do the we'll do the dance. Yeah, that sounds good. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. Are you, are you guys actually using it, by the way? Me. The web code. Yeah. Uh, we are about to. We're okay. in uh, kind of pre-release testing on on some of it. So I'll try to get this done as fast as possible, and then you guys can maybe test it out at your own pace, and then you know let me know what else I need to do that that does or doesn't work with your existing system. Does that yeah, sound fair? well, this is going to be kind of weird for us because we have something that is, uh, it's remarkably similar to WebSockets, but it's not compliant with web, WebSockets. And so uh, we're trying to shoehorn it in. Oh, you're already, you're already doing some sort of weird dance. Yeah, yeah. We, yes, we have a, we made a network filter that modifies the request coming in to make it more WebSocket compliant. And uh, yeah. Oh, also on doing this, I say we should make it a general like, hey, this is an upgrade path, not WebSocket specific, so that later on, if we want to do like connect or whatever, mm -hmm. we just say this is how we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't want to have it be like the WebSocket filter chain, and then we have to have a connect filter chain. Maybe people want different ones. I don't want to support it yet. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Okay. I will document this, unbug, leave it open for a couple of days for people to 
discuss, see if anyone has strong opinions on, you know, which way we treat it and uh, start working. Great. That sounds awesome. Cool. Um, did anyone have anything else that they wanted to bring up? A question on issue management. Do we have some sort of a bot integration or else plans to have one for assigning an issue to you if you don't have right access to assign it yourself? You say, I would like this assigned to me and one of the maintainers assigns it to you. It would be nice nah, to have a I mean, a there's, bot, please do a bot. There's, a, there's an open issue on bots. If anyone wants to work on bots, that would be great. <laughs> would you find this as a use case or would you prefer just uh, like ping a maintainer and say, can you assign this? We would to love me? to have the bot that let you auto assign. If you write it, we will approve it. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's uh, just search for bot in the existing issues and there's a wish list of bots. Uh, and, and it's like, you know, they've been doing a bunch of stuff with like ProBot and, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so it's possible these things will exist. It would probably be better to even do it as part of the ProBot, you know, project in GitHub and then everyone can get it. Um, but that, that would be awesome. I think there's still the issue that you okay, need right. the Envoy organization, but I get the bot groups. That, but that can, that can actually assign to somebody who isn't in the Envoy organization. Oh, oh yeah. No, that I was, think that maybe we would just converge on those folks who actually regularly would be assigned issues. It wouldn't be an issue, but. I mean, I don't, I don't actually think in GitHub you can assign to someone that is not in, in the org. So it's like people have to get added to the org, which I, I mean, to be honest, like there's no, I, I just add people to the org who have like shown interest basically, like it doesn't really matter. Uh, so, so that's fine. Cool. Anyone have anything else? Hey, uh, Michael Payne here. Um, I've been trying to compile Envoy uh, on Arch uh, 64 or ARM 64, and I, I did raise an issue, but um, just a super short update. It's, I, it's, it's still not working. So Bazel doesn't support Arch 64 properly. Uh, the rules, uh, rules go for Bazel doesn't support it either. Um, and Lyft's uh, Proton Gen Validate won't compile on anything that's not Windows or, or Darwin, from what I can see. So uh, uh, the the struggle continues. So uh, I'll I'll keep you updated. Fight, fight that basil fight. Yes. <laughs> Very nice beard, also. Thank you. <laughs> I went right. to Australia, and this is what happened. <laughs> I have to hop off, um, but if but if people want to keep talking, go go for it. Um, all right. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great week. <laughs>